Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and today we're going to talk about angiotensin II receptor blockers, also called ARBs. And as always, after you get done watching this YouTube video, you can access the free quiz that will test you on this medication. So let's get started. As we've been studying these medications in this pharmacology series, we have been remembering the mnemonic NURSE. This helps us remember those important concepts we need to know for exams. So N again is for names specifically the family name of the drug, because this really tells us how this medication works. Then U for use, what's it used to treat? R for responsibilities of the nurse, what's our role? S for side effects, and then E for education for the patient. Those important teaching points we need to point out to the patient who will be taking this medication. So first, let's start out talking about the name. We're dealing with angiotensin II receptor blockers, and these drugs are also referred to as ARBs. Now, one thing to make your job easier is that you wanna remember that these drugs, specifically the generic name, end with the word sartan at the end, S-A-R-T-A-N. So when you're looking at a patient's medication list, you'll be able to recognize it a lot easier. So examples of ARBs would be like low sartan, val sartan, only sartan, just to name a few. Now let's talk about how these ARBs work and let the name, the family name of any drug you're studying always help you because it's going to give you clues of how it works and if you can connect which system it's manipulating, it makes it so much easier to understand side effects and really your responsibilities as a nurse and what you teach the patient. So we're talking about angiotensin II receptor blockers. So that's telling us that this drug is going to block the receptors that deal with angiotensin II. So since we're dealing with angiotensin II, what system are we gonna be dealing with? The RAS, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And this system deals with managing our blood pressure, especially when it drops too low. So ARBs, they affect the end result of RAS. What's the end result of RAS? Well, we talked about in a review over the RAS system that its whole goal is to activate angiotensin II to get it on board so we can have vasoconstriction of vessels and help increase blood volume through like the release of aldosterone. So that system increases blood pressure when we need it to because blood pressure has just dropped so low that the patient is gonna be perfused very well so they need that system. Now what an ARB is gonna do it's going to block that from really happening because the blood pressure needs to be decreased. So how ARBs work is that they block the activation of certain receptor sites that would accept that angiotensin II once it's activated by the system. And we're specifically talking about receptor sites called angiotensin II receptor type one. And these type one receptors are found mainly in the vessels of smooth muscle and the adrenal glands. So if we block these type ones from accepting this angiotensin II, what are we gonna do? Well, instead of vasoconstricting, we're gonna vasodilate. When we vasodilate, we decrease systemic vascular resistance and decrease the blood pressure. Well, one thing that angiotensin II normally does is it triggers the release of aldosterone, which is going to cause the kidneys to conserve sodium and water, but excrete potassium in hopes of increasing the blood volume. So if we increase blood volume, we increase blood pressure. Well, that's not gonna happen if we block this receptor site because that receptor site is really what deals with that. So in a sense, we're gonna decrease the blood volume because we're gonna excrete sodium and water and keep some potassium. Now let's do a quick review over RAS and throw in an angiotensin II receptor blocker and see how the system changes. And if you want a more in-depth look at the RAS, I have a video where I go over it in detail, but right here, I'm just gonna quickly review it. So the whole point of RAS is to manage your blood pressure especially whenever it drops, it needs it back up. So the blood pressure drops, this will cause the kidneys to release renin. Whenever renin's present in the circulation, it activates a substance in the liver called angiotensinogen. Angiotensinogen is going to turn into angiotensin one. Now we need angiotensin one to get to angiotensin two. And in order to do that, we need a special substance called ACE. 
A stands for angiotensin converting enzyme, and then that turns it into angiotensin II. So we're there. This is the goal of RAS, is to get angiotensin II on board. Now we have angiotensin II floating in the system. It needs to attach to some receptor sites so we can get the job done. You have angiotensin II receptor um, type 1, and you also have angiotensin II receptor type 2. But we're not dealing with these type 2, so don't even think about those for ARBs because ARBs work on um, the angiotensin II receptor type 1 sites. That's what we care about for this lecture. So angiotensin II goes and binds with these receptor sites, the type 1. And whenever that occurs, you're going to get vasoconstriction of the vessels, which is going to increase systemic vascular resistance and increase blood pressure. And it's also going to trigger the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. And when aldosterone is present, it's going to cause the kidneys to keep sodium and water, but will excrete potassium. So we'll increase blood volume. And remember, it's that same concept. If you increase with the water hose, you increase the amount of water that's going through that water hose and constrict that hose down, that's majorly going to increase the pressure of the water coming out of the hose. Same concept really applies to the vessels in our body. So that is what it's doing. So now let's throw in an angiotensin II receptor blocker. What's it going to do? What's it going to affect? Well, we have these angiotensin II receptor type 1s hanging out, and they're ready to receive this angiotensin II. But this patient has taken an ARB. Well, this connection is not going to happen. This angiotensin II is not going to be able to go to these type 1 receptors. So we don't have that occurring. We have blocked that. So the result is going to be we get vasodilation of the vessels. Whenever that occurs, we're going to decrease systemic vascular resistance. We're going to decrease blood pressure. It's going to make it a lot easier for that heart to pump blood through the body because it's not hitting that resistance. So it's going to decrease afterload. Also, you're going to get a decrease in preload. And we're going to excrete sodium and water instead of keeping it, but we can keep some potassium. So it has like the opposite effects. So some things you need to watch out both with ACE inhibitors and ARBs is that increasing potassium level, so hyperkalemia. So we see that ARBs affect RAS, just like ACE inhibitors, but they do it in a little bit different way. ACE inhibitors, instead of blocking these receptor sites, they inhibit ACE, hence why we call them ACE inhibitors. So they prevent this ACE from converting angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Now, remember, whenever we talked about our ACE inhibitors, we talked about that some patients, not all, but some patients can get this persistent dry cough and they just can't take the medication. So a lot of physicians will put them on an ARB instead of an ACE inhibitor. Now, why? Do they get a dry persistent cough with ACE inhibitors, but not with ARBs? Well, ACE, let's talk about that substance. ACE, what it does is it will inactivate a substance called bradykinin. Bradykinin is like an inflammatory substance. So it inactivates it by breaking it down normally. So you're breaking down bradykinin, you don't have all this bradykinin hanging out causing issues. But if we throw in an ACE inhibitor that inhibits this ACE, you no longer have the inactivation of bradykinin with it being broke down. So now you'll have increased levels of bradykinin, which in some patients can cause that dry, persistent cough. So if we switch them to an ARB, ARBs don't inhibit ACE. So this ACE phenomenon will occur. You'll have angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So we're not going to be increasing our bradykinin levels because ACE is going to be able to inactivate the bradykinin by breaking it down. So that is why a dry persistent cough is a lot less likely with an ARB. Now let's talk about what ARBs are used for. Well, we've already established the fact that ARBs help lower the blood pressure. So people who struggle with high blood pressure, they have hypertension, this medication can be prescribed along with the patient also making lifestyle changes because these blood pressure medicines are not a cure. They help bring the blood pressure down, but the patient needs to, if they smoke, to quit smoking, 
exercise, diet, etc. Another thing that ARBs can treat is in these type 2 diabetic patients who have diabetic nephropathy. And this is a fancy word of saying they have kidney disease related to diabetes. And how an ARB will work is that it will slow down the progression of the disease. Now ACE inhibitors also do this as well. So keep that in mind. They both can help with diabetic nephropathy in type 2 diabetics. And how it does this is that ARBs lower the blood pressure. Well, patients who have kidney disease, they aren't able to really filter the protein like they should. So protein will leak into the urine. And the higher the blood pressure, the more protein that's going to leak into the urine, which can cause even more problems. So if we throw an ARB on, ACE inhibitor, it will lower the blood pressure, which will decrease the amount of protein in the urine, which is going to, over time, slow down the progression of this kidney disease. Another condition that ARBs are used for is heart failure. And remember with heart failure, the heart is so weak that it can't really pump blood out of it. So cardiac output diminishes and blood can even backflow into the lungs leading to pulmonary edema and causing swelling and backflowing of blood throughout the body. So how an ARB can help once you throw that on board is that remember an ARB vasodilate. So when we vasodilate vessels, that decreases systemic vascular resistance. And this is really the resistance that this heart must pump against to get blood out of it. So if we decrease the resistance, we're going to make it a lot easier for the heart to squeeze blood out of it. So we're decreasing the afterload. So afterload again was the amount of resistance that the ventricles must overcome to pop open those valves so blood can leave it. In addition, the way that ARBs work and how it manipulates the sodium and the water with the kidneys is that we can decrease preload, which is the amount of blood that fills in that ventricle at the end of diastole. So if we can decrease preload, afterload, we'll make it a lot easier on the heart to pump in a patient who has heart failure. Now let's talk about the responsibilities of the nurse. So we're giving our patient an ARB and ARBs lower the blood pressure. So a big thing what we wanna do is we want to assess that blood pressure routinely along with their pulse. And what we're watching out for is hypotension where that systolic, that top number, is getting less than 90. And some patients are gonna have a more increased risk of developing hypotension, especially if they're taking diuretics along with taking an ARB because if we're diuresing them where they're urinating out their extra fluid volume, we can bottom out their blood volume, which can cause even more hypotension. In addition, let's say that they're started on some new cardiac meds with their ARB. You really wanna monitor them closely because we could drop their blood pressure too low. Or if the patient is dehydrated, they already have low fluid volume, and how this medication works, remember with the RAS, it affects how the kidneys deal with sodium and water. So you also want to watch out for this hypotension. Next, you wanna monitor their potassium levels because remember, we are at the end with the aldosterone. What's happening is we're really reversing how aldosterone works. So the kidneys are gonna excrete sodium and water, but it's gonna keep potassium. So in some patients, their potassium levels can become elevated. And you really wanna watch that in those patients who have the diabetic nephropathy, their kidney function is already compromised. So closely monitor that potassium level. A normal level is 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. Another thing to monitor for is renal failure. And you may be thinking, okay, how can this cause renal failure? Since you talked about in the treatment part what it's used for, it can actually help slow down the progression of kidney disease in type 2 diabetics. Well, renal failure can occur in some patients who are at risk. And patients who are at risk are patients who have severe heart failure. Because remember what I talked about with heart failure, their cardiac output isn't that great. So they really depend on RAS, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, to help them maintain their cardiac output. So they're very dependent on that. And if we go and throw this medication on them, it can lead to renal failure. So keep that in mind. And what are some signs and symptoms that they may be having renal failure? Well, you wanna look at their kidney function with their BUN and creatinine. It's 
increasing. A normal BUN is about 5 to 20, and normal creatinine is 0.6 to 1.2 milligrams per deciliter. In addition, you can look at their urinary output. How much have they put out of urine on your shift? You wanted at least 30 cc's per hour. And are they retaining fluid where those kidneys aren't able to excrete the water because they're failing? So look at their daily weights and just look on their body. Are they retaining extra fluid in their tissues? Also monitor liver enzymes, especially patients who are at risk with for liver disease. This drug can actually increase the level. So looking at those. And lastly, I wanted to mention this angioedema. This is very rare to occur in a patient who is taking an ARB compared to an ACE inhibitor. So it's not likely to occur in a patient taking ARB, but it can, it has occurred in some patients. So I just wanted you to be aware of it. And this is where you get swelling in those deep tissues and it can be swelling of the face, the lips, the tongue, and it can cause them difficulty breathing. So always look at that with your patient who is taking this. Now let's wrap up this lecture and let's talk about some side effects and education pieces for the patient who's taking an ARP. So some quick side effects would be you'd want to tell the patient that they could experience dizziness because you know we're altering the blood pressure. So when they change positions or stand up they need to do this slowly. They want to be on the lookout for hypotension, that blood pressure dropping too low, high potassium level, and GI upset. Now education pieces, which actually tie in with some of those signs and symptoms. You want to teach the patient to regularly monitor their blood pressure at home. Show them how to do this, where they can buy a device, the importance of recording those numbers and notifying the physician of anything abnormal. What's abnormal versus normal. So educate them the importance on that. Also to avoid salt substitutes with potassium in them or consuming a diet really rich in potassium, especially if they're taking diuretics that conserve or spare potassium, like spironoactolone. And um, because this can increase their potassium levels really high, and ARBs already have that effect where they can increase potassium, so let them know that. Next, to never abruptly just quit taking the medication. They just don't want to take it anymore, or they have literally just forgot for a long time to take their medication because ARBs and ACEs, they have this thing that they can cause called rebound hypertension, where the blood pressure can just get so high and it's really hard to control. I have seen this in patients who haven't been compliant with their medications that it can occur. So tell them about the risk. The best way to prevent it is to never just abruptly quit taking the medication. Also, missing a dose. Say they missed a dose. What are they supposed to do because they're at risk for this? Well, if they miss a dose, if they remember it the same day, go ahead and take the dose. But if they don't remember it to the next day, don't take that missed dose that they missed on the previous day, but just take the scheduled dose for that day. And the importance of lifestyle changes. These hyper, anti-hypertensive medications do not cure their hypertension. They need to, if they smoke, to quit smoking. They need to follow a healthy diet and exercise, which can help with these medications. Okay, so that wraps up this review over angiotensin II receptor blockers. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.